Welcome to the Field Crops Virtual Breakfast. This morning we have Eric Karbowski, who is one of our behavioral health educators with the Michigan State University Extension Health and Nutrition Institute. Um, and Eric's going to go ahead and discuss assessing farm stress with us. So don't forget to use your chat um, for any questions you may have. And then Phil has also input some information as far as what you need to do if you need um, an RUP credit, as well as the email and information. So don't forget to take a look at that. All right, Eric, it's all you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Eric Karbowski, and as Erica shared, um, I'm a behavioral health educator with the Health and Nutrition Institute uh, and focusing on farm stress. And today we're going to talk a little bit about stress. Um, some questions, um, open-ended questions that might help engage in conversation, uh, and some warning signs of suicide. And I know in this, uh, it's going to be fast and furious here with just our uh, short short meeting. But um, so, what is stress? Stress is defined as a need or demand people confront that is perceived as burdensome or threatening, and can lead to physical or mental health problems. And we all know what stress uh, have experienced stress and uh, have an idea. A feeling of what that may look like. And when I when I talk about stress, I always encourage people to think about what does stress look like for you? What does it sound like to you? What are some, uh, how do you react to stress? Um, I know there's a stress eater that's talking to you right now. I know that there are other, you know, different people you may act out or, or ask somebody that knows you well, um, what, is, what does it look like when you do experience stress? Um, and I encourage you to just become aware, you know, bring awareness to what are some of those things that create stress in your life, uh, what that may look like, what that may sound like. And so when you are confronted with it, we're better able, we're better equipped to respond to that. So as I talked uh, a little bit earlier, some signs of stress that you might experience on the body could be headaches, stomach aches, back aches, uh, high blood pressure, uh, high blood sugar, heart racing or nausea. Uh, in your mind, you might feel anxious. Some people act out uh, and are angry. It might be uh, people that are experiencing a significant amount of stress might feel sad or bitter, um, depressed or hopeless. Um, and some common actions that you see for people that are experiencing a significant amount of stress are they maybe they can't sleep or they're sleeping too much. Um, they might be overeating or not eating at all. Um, and then oftentimes you'll see an increased use in substance abuse or nicotine um, because of result of it's a it's a coping mechanism that many people uh, tend to to gravitate towards um, acting out in frustration. People might break things or yelling um, or oftentimes we'll also see people that will start to withdraw if they're experiencing a lot of stress begin to uh, be a little more isolated in nature. So when you think about stress um, and either dealing with stress in yourself uh, or communicating with somebody that, it, that is experiencing stress, um, some tools for connecting with them and engaging in conversation are asking open-ended questions. Uh, and open-ended questions are, in, uh, <clears throat> it's an approach really that uh, helps the, um, the two people get, um, you know, have a better uh, dialogue. Um, it, re it, it encourages um, more beyond just yes and no answers. And so um, this is just going to be a brief snapshot and know that um, after just hearing this conversation, practice makes perfect. So the more time you, you think about uh, practice this approach um, and ask open-ended questions, um, the better you'll be at it. And I think you can incorporate this in your business life. You can incorporate this in your personal life. It just really does give you some structure for, um, <clears throat> you know, having better and open dialogue. So as I just shared, uh, closed-ended questions um, are going to be the ones that are going to give you um, a yes or no answer, or I don't know. And open-ended questions really help engage in deeper and richer conversations. And so some of those examples <clears throat> for um, questions close-ended questions. Uh, are you ready to make a decision? That's going to give you a yes or a no response. Um, but maybe a different way to put it uh, in perspective is, you know, what's holding you back from making a decision? Um, sometimes you may learn, you know, by just asking that first question, um, you may hear like, uh, no, I'm not ready to make a decision. Um, but maybe, you know, in that second example, what's holding you back from making a decision, you know, maybe you might uh, learn from an agricultural perspective that, you know, it's 
brother's in a dairy operation and one is burnt out and doesn't want to be part of it anymore and is thinking about selling the cows, but instead, um, you know, that's that more deep, rich conversation. And then you could work with them through that perspective and have a better understanding where they're coming from. Again, I'm not going to read through all of these, but, you know, just some examples. Are you feeling okay? Um, a different way to put that. Tell me what's bothering you. It's going to give you that opportunity when you're having that conversation with <clears throat> either your, you know, whoever it may be, um, to to get a better understanding about where they're coming from, what their perspectives are, what their true thoughts are, opposed to just the the superficial yes no easy out responses. So this next topic is pretty difficult. Um, it is a heavy conversation. Um, so just please know that uh, guard yourself a little bit as we go into this. Um, <clears throat> but I also like to share with people um, part of my calling, I think, to this role, and I feel very fortunate about it, is having served in the public mental health system for uh, 10 years. I've had the uh, unfortunate experience, both personally and professionally, to see the loss of life by suicide. Uh, and so I share that knowing that I don't have all of the answers, but I also share that um, to know that, you know, bringing awareness to this, um, to this situation um, really can save lives. And we're going to give you <clears throat> just a couple of uh, warning signs, uh, as well as a couple of things, uh, a couple of tools that hopefully you can use. So when somebody, uh, oftentimes, when somebody is thinking about suicide or taking their life by suicide, you may see um, people that are feeling lost or hopeless. They may start giving away some of their prized possessions. And prized possessions doesn't have to be like a big uh, financial amount. It doesn't have to be like a $10,000 gift or something like that. It could be as subtle as a, a family heirloom belt buckle that, you know, just randomly shows up um, and says, well, why did, why did Eric give me that? That doesn't... Uh, that doesn't, it just came out of nowhere. Um, oftentimes in the agricultural community, acquiring means isn't, that, isn't something that we will see as much because uh, the farmers will typically have access to, <clears throat> to lethal uh, weapons if they wanted or whatever that, you know, that resource could be. Uh, saying goodbye, uh, oftentimes we'll see um, somebody that is concerned about or thinking about suicide, they'll really become isolated they'll stop engaging in a lot of the different things that they've been uh, participating in or involved in for several years. Maybe they are part of a coffee group that, um, you know, for years met uh, every morning, virtual breakfast, um, but wouldn't be virtual. Um, and then they just stopped attending. Um, and so I think as friends, it's, it's important to recognize some of those loss of interest. Um, you know, they're just, they stop caring about a lot of the things. Maybe it's a, you know, a farmer that has a really well manicured yard um, and they've always had immaculate flower beds and then now there are weeds in it and then there's uh, the grass is not kept, kept up the way they had typically had in the, in the past. That could be a warning sign of stress and it could also be um, that they're thinking suicide because of they're just feeling all of this mounted pressure. And we might see mood changes, periods of highs and lows, ups and downs. Um, I know this is this is difficult, and again, just like asking open-ended questions, practice makes perfect. If you have, if you recognize or see any of these signs of, of suicide, ask them directly if they're thinking about taking their life by suicide. Don't ask if you're thinking about, um, are you thinking about hurting yourself, because those could be two very different things. So um, if you see that, um, research suggests that it is not going to increase the likelihood that somebody would follow through uh, and take their own life by asking. Oftentimes what it is, you'll see the opposite. Uh, people will feel a little bit relieved because they feel like, oh, okay, uh, I don't have to hide the secret anymore. Or you can also help them find the supports that they might need. And so again, I'm just going to reiterate that point by asking somebody, evidence and research suggests that it is not going to increase the likelihood that they would follow through. And so what if someone says yes? The biggest thing you can do, um, and I don't know that any of us are mental health experts on this call, but if you are, uh, you may have a different response. But <clears throat> if someone says yes, the biggest thing you can do is just don't leave them alone. Don't say, you'll get through it. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll follow up tomorrow. If they say yes, I'm thinking about taking my life. Um, just don't leave them alone. Um, if they're in a, if they're in a position, um, I was asked a really good question the other day. 
is it okay to call 911 in that in that position? And I think it, it is totally okay to, to call 911, make sure that you get the right help. And I think just know that in that moment, you'll be doing the right thing if you're with them. Uh, if it's somebody that it is in a very hostile situation, call 911. Again, another resource is the National Suicide Prevention Line. You may say, hey, I'm concerned about you. Eric, I've recognized this, 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 and this. Um, are you thinking about suicide? And if Eric says yes, then maybe you could just, a response to that could be, Eric, can we call this National Suicide Lifeline together? I, I'll be with you on the call to get it started and I can step away so you can have your, your time. Um, that might just be an example of, of something you might be able to do. Another resource that uh, I'd like to share, uh, I'm very proud of is that locally MSU Extension, we have a pilot project. Um, so if you do have somebody or if you recognize somebody that's experiencing significant amounts of stress uh, or thinking about suicide, um, we, we now have a pilot project um, for online counseling. Um, we do have some funds available, so we really wanted to eliminate as many of the barriers as possible so that people that need the help and support can get that. Um, so the, there is that uh, website there. You can also reach out to me at any point and I can be the conduit to connect you with those resources. But all of the um, counselors that are <clears throat> participating in this program um, work for Pine Rest, but more importantly, they have a connection to the agricultural industry. So um, they are either farmers themselves, have a sibling or a family that is a farmer. So they can, in many levels, empathize with some of the struggles and the ups and downs and uncontrollable risk factors that, um, you know, farmers experience every day. Uh, and then the other uh, resource that I wanted to share is that, um, very uh, recently, um, MSU Extension partnered with American Farm Bureau, uh, Farm Credit, National Farmers Union, um, as well as the uh, Illinois uh, University Extension. And we created um, a free open to the public farm stress online class. Um, and so if you go to there's tinyurl.com, we also have it up on our MSU Extension website. Farm Bureau has it on their website. National Farmers Union has it on their website. Um, and so essentially it's, it's an online class that has three units that talks about farm stress. Some of the overlapping information that I just shared with you is on there. Uh, and it also has a list of resources that, that are available to you. So um, with that, I just want to say thank you very much for being with us this morning. Um, I'm going to stick around if there are any questions um, and know that there are a lot of people out there that are working very hard behind the scenes to create resources uh, to help the agricultural community out. So thank you and have a great weekend. Great, thank you so much, Eric. First question here, are those experiencing stress likely to open up if we are in a position to ask the open-ended questions? Um, I think every situation's unique, um, but you know, I think open-ended questions will definitely help people become more engaged in the conversation. Um, it, it requires them to think a little bit and, and it, it allows you to probe a little bit farther other than just yes or no. And that's very closed off. So, um, you know, I think it's hopefully it's a tool to help you uh, down that roadmap um, of that conversation or down that path of that conversation. So I hope that answers that question. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and I'll ask just one last question um, before we move on. What made you interested in getting started? in kind of down this path you you had mentioned you had personally had some experience with some of these farm stress triggers so yeah well um i have a connection to the agricultural community um my grandparents were farmers um, and i married into a farm family and so i recognize uh, a lot of levels and again as i as i shared i worked in the public mental health system for 10 years um you know, so that was a really nice overlap. And I think I, uh, from that perspective, you know, as I shared earlier, I don't have all of the answers by any stretch of the imagination, but, um, you know, I do have that connection and I, I recognize the, um, oftentimes, you know, I think defense mechanisms, I will call them. Um, but you know, farmers are a very proud subculture. And I think oftentimes communication, uh, is difficult for them because they are fiercely independent and, um, you know, I think they take a lot of pride in that and, and, and it takes a lot of, uh, it takes a strong person that's confident and comfortable, I think enough in themselves to reach out to say that, you know, I'm struggling a little bit, I could use some help. Um, and so I think that was really my calling is to just, 
um, you know, share that it's okay to uh, be a former offensive lineman and need help. Right. You know, I think that uh, it's okay that, um, you know, everybody, you know, all of the farmers right now are struggling uh, in some capacity, even though the weather's been nice and, you know, but there are always those concerns. And I think just being confident enough and, and a knowing where the resources are, but also a uh, being confident, confident and comfortable enough to reach out to, to access some of those supports when they're, when they, when they need them. Eric, do you have a slide that has a list of resources on it? There are a lot of resources on our MSU Extension website. Um, I actually uh, cut a bunch of those out just um, to, to fit the timeline. But uh, again, I have, um, if you go to the MSU Extension Farm Stress website, there are a list of resources that are available. We've tried to keep that updated, um, as well as a lot of different topics, um, you know, just associated with farm stress and resources and ideas. So. Okay, excellent. Um, and I can put that website into the chat here for people, and then um, we can also, those who would like more information, feel free to reach out to Eric or anybody else that you know within an MSU extension. Well, I think we're going to stick around for some questions that ah. have come up. Uh, for the specialists that are out there, I, I know that there are several questions that have been asked generally about insects, but I, I had a question actually about armyworm and alfalfa. Chris, is there any history of having armyworm going to an alfalfa field at all? Yes, there must be because I listed in my guide, but I don't think that it is particularly common. The pictures that I've been getting lately, people are sending me pictures of armyworms that are dead and they're parasitized or they're pupating or they have things, they have a disease or something like that. So Phil, I would wonder in your area, how big of an armyworm do you have right now? Because I think those flights uh, uh, all happened in that early to mid May time frame. I'm not really sure that it was armyworm because they were asking the question about alfalfa that looked like it hadn't come back. And so they asked about whether it was weevil, and I said, no, it wouldn't be weevil because we've got way too much heat and those uh, larvae would have pupated by now. And I was thinking, could it be armyworm possibly? And what you're telling me is probably the answer is no due to the same reason that weevil well, are gone. Well, they mar I mean, they would march potentially over. I mean, it could be uh, we when weevils uh, come out, the adults will feed a little bit, and you could have had some late lar some late larval feeding. But then again, once you're into July, the weevils are estivating, which means they sleep in the summer. So, uh, depending on the time frame of the field that they were calling you about, then it could have been if it was earlier, it could have been some weevil feeding at the end and some, a little bit of adult feeding. But we, we have to identify the pest before we talk about it, sort of. It's been pretty quiet bug-wise, except for all these pictures of dead armyworms and saying, what is this? And there's been some pretty cool cool pictures. Chris, I am expecting a lot of leafhopper challenges in alfalfa and probably dry beans, too, with this hot, dry weather. Yep, there's going to exasperate it. There's interactions that go beyond the actual, so if you have the effect of dry weather and the effect of the leafhopper, when you put them together, the effect isn't one plus one is two, it's three. So uh, you have to be really careful. The thresholds in these uh, crops are pretty good. Dry, dry beans has a threshold based on a leaf, leaf number and a, for a, alfalfa you do sweeping. So I would, I would, keep, I would keep on that. I'm trying to think if there's another crop uh, besides dry beans. Some some of the veg crops can get uh, hammered by leafhopper. Corn would be okay. So soy would be okay, uh, but alfalfa and beans would be the two that we're kind of worried about. And if and if spider mite starts, it's probably going to be on the edges of fields. Whereas you're driving along that dusty field edge, where you get that yellowing that starts on the edge and then begins to move in. So that would be the first sign of uh, spider mite on on beans. A lot of time is when is when we'll see it first. If I may, with the hot dry weather, how's that going to affect tar spots, especially the folks out southwest where they're up to V8, 10? Hi, uh, that'll that should um, keep it in check. That's for sure. We haven't had any reports of tar spot yet. I think the earliest we've sort of seen it is um, probably the second week of July. Um, that was that was a few years ago though. Um, so I I don't really expect it, you know, to to 
certainly not to take off or anything that's really going to slow it down. So it's going to be favoured by cool, wet conditions. Is there a time period where if we can keep it warm and dry enough that tar spot won't be able to impact the crop going forward at a certain date? Uh, well, not really, no. I mean, so the problem is, uh, especially once we get, it, it, it'll just delay things, right? So 2018 was a pretty bad, bad year because we had a lot of uh, moisture during the season, right? Like, a lot of rainfall during the season. Uh, 2019, it was much slower to develop. Uh, we were pretty dry mid, mid July and August. So that really slowed things down. Um, so any sort of leaf wetness events are gonna sort of help drive that. And as we start getting, you know, heavier dews and cooler conditions later into the season, that's gonna drive disease. I have a question for Manny Singh. Manny, as we see these plants go into moisture stress, do the plants shut down or do they continue to have the roots go deeper and, and look for water? Is that a phenomenon where the, the plants won't be able to go for the water if it is deeper or not? I know Jeff talked about the fact that there's not enough water to sustain, but uh, many of the <coughs> plants will try and get there if they can. Or does that stop? Yeah, Phil, that's a... Uh... Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So it's going to depend on, again, I think that evaporative demand that uh, <clears throat> was, uh, was talked about before, right? So uh, I believe we are still early in the, in the growing season. So the roots are looking still, right? They are going to based on how, how the planting conditions were. And this year, I think we were okay. We didn't, uh, I think, muddy the seed in, I think, as much as it happened last year, right? So I I would assume the, the root structure is in a better position to, to go deeper and find that, that moisture that's sit, <clears throat> sitting in a, in a deeper profile, right? So um, I'm hopeful that, uh, that, yeah, that that will happen this year based on what our, what our planting conditions were. And it's going to depend on the, on the crop as well, right? Uh, corn will behave a little bit differently than, than then, then soybeans and the, the, the demand of water will, will vary again based on the, on the growth stage we are in, right? I think Bruce talked about some of the advanced uh, corn in his area is already V8, V10. So, so that's probably a little bit further along, has more leaf area and will have more demand for the, for, for, for the moisture it's looking for. But yeah, hopefully we'll get like some, some moisture in the, in, in the next couple of days. Bill, um, this is Mike Staten. There, there is soybeans are very good at coping, and one of the mechanisms they have, of course, is they do reduce the shoot growth um, when mm -hmm. when moisture stress is tight. So they reduce the shoot growth, but they maintain the root growth, and so you will see just exactly what you described and what Manny was describing, where you'll continue to get root growth even though the plants seem to be staying put and not growing above ground. There is an article that I put in the past, and I can certainly do this. Uh, we did it in 2012 in the drought, and I think we did it maybe a year ago. Um, but it's, it's how soybeans will react to moisture stress at different growth stages. But they are a very um, interesting plant because they have such a long blossoming period that they're more forgiving mm -hmm. than corn in many ways from, from drought stress. Yep. And that's a pretty good point, Mike, right? I mean, what? what growth stage that is occurring, right? And for corn, the main worry is that pollination period, right? That is when corn is really sensitive and we are still not there yet. And hopefully things will be better by that time. So I've been we are already flowering. I have seen a couple of fields around here on campus. I don't know what you guys have seen out there, but soybeans are much more forgiving at that stage. When they're filling that seed around R3, or later, that's I think when uh, when availability of moisture becomes more critical. Even going to that R five to R seven stage, and we are we are ways out uh, from from that. Mike, have you seen uh, much flowering? Uh, what are you seeing with with soybeans? Yes, Manny, we are. We're definitely flowering, and uh, um, actually had reports of Mid Michigan of, and of course it's easy because the plants are short typically, and so you're going to mm -hmm. uh, looks like more blossoms than. Than, than what we think, but R2, we actually have some producers in mid-Michigan that are in the R2 growth stage, and uh, so things are progressing phenologically. Um, mm -hmm. So 
It's yeah, we had a lot of early planted soybeans this year, right? So um, I'm not surprised that they're moving along. That's right. Okay. So my the news is that. Go ahead. Well, Mike. the last thing I was going to say, Phil, is that, like Manny said, is that um, one of the other ways of managing drought, a recommendation for managing drought in soybeans is early planting. It gives you a better root structure, better root growth. So um, those of you that did replant early, and, and even if you had to replant some of those plants, you're still um, having those early plant beans in there is a good thing going into dry conditions. So that would, that would tell me if it's hot and dry, that we're probably less likely to have white mold problems this year. Is that right? I would agree with that. Um, the temperature typically, Phil, is 85 degrees or above. If you have temperatures above 85 degrees, it really is d uh, difficult for uh, mold to, to, to form and to, and to spread. Um, and then the lack of moisture, like you say, we may not even get the apothecia. I have not run the model um, yet, and I should do that because my new phone does have capability of that. <laughs> Has anybody else run the uh, Sportcaster model? I haven't. Okay, I need to do that, but my guess is it's going to be very, very low. I think the exception would be irrigation again, though, Mike. Um, there's a report from ABC Consulting of an apothecia in um, potatoes. That's sort of our first report of the season, but just be mindful, you know, under irrigation, things are pretty different and we're pretty often at risk, especially if we're uh, narrow rows. 15 inches. Really good, really good point, Marty. And, and this probably goes without saying, but those of you that are in that irrigated area and run the Sporecaster, you're not considered an irrigated field in Sporecaster unless you're applying water. I should have known that, but I, I made some mistakes last year in running it. I just assumed since it had a center pivot in it, I called it an irrigated field. But it is not an irrigated field in Sporecaster unless you are turning it on, unless you're applying water. With the growth, the soybean roots, and the pollination be applicable to dry beans, especially when they're planted in June? Yeah, that's a, a good question. I don't have uh, experience with dry beans, so hopefully somebody on the call can, can answer that. Can you repeat that question real quick for me? There was discussion about the root growth in soybeans and the pollination of the soybeans being not affected so bad by the hot and dry weather. The question is, does that same discussion apply to dry beans? Um, anecdotally, I would think so. Um, if we think back to 2019, or 2018, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, when we had, you know, we planted in almost dust um, as far as our dry bean crops. Um, and growers, you know, kind of called wondering if these beans are, are going to make it. They look so dry. Uh, but that was the year we actually broke our state record for dry bean yields in the state of Michigan. Um, so we think it does really help set those roots. Um, obviously, we have to have the right conditions come flowering um, for sure. August will definitely make or break a dry bean. Um, but dry, dry weather does help us set those roots early in the season, I believe. Scott, this is, is there are any of the dry bean varieties uh, semi-determinant or determinant where they would blossom in a much shorter period than what soybeans do? Yes. Yeah, when we talk about, you know, kidney beans or cranberry beans, those would be determinant. Um, so those can be affected by drought much, much greater than our indeterminate varieties like blacks and navies. But most of those determinant beans are grown under irrigation too. There are exceptions, but, but most would be irrigated. Excellent. All right. Well, I don't see any more in the chat. Yeah, and I, I think with that, we'll we'll go ahead and wrap it up and thank everybody for their time and thank you to our speakers as well. Anything else you needed to say, Phil? Thank you, Erica. Have a great 4th okay. of July. All right. Happy 4th, everybody.